Um, yeah, so hi everyone, it's very nice to meet you all and thank you for the invite. Uh, today I'm going to be telling you about H1 intensity mapping for cosmology. So I'm first going to tell you a bit about the motivation behind H1 intensity mapping and some of the instrumental and systematic effects that it suffers from, and then how we can model the H1 power spectrum and how we can then do cosmological parameter estimation. And I'm going to go back to these systematic effects and talk a bit about how we can best deal with them and remove the foregrounds. So first, the motivation. So we're very interested in observing the large scale structure. So how matter is organized on the larger scales. This help, helps us answer a lot of open questions in cosmology, you know, such as how much matter is there in the universe? What happened during inflation? What is the nature of gravity? So a great way of doing this is using galaxies, for example, because most of the matter in the universe is dark, so we can't really see it. Um, so we can use galaxies as tracers, which is really great, but it can be um, a bit expensive to resolve each individual galaxy. So to make really large surveys, it can be very time consuming to resolve every single one. But uh, with H1 intensity mapping, this, is, this can be a complementary uh, way of trying to observe the large scale structure because after reionization, most of the neutral hydrogen or H1 in the universe can be found inside of self-shielding galaxies, which means that H1 is also a good tracer for dark matter in the same way that galaxies are. And it's good for mapping large scales of large areas of the sky very quickly because you're not trying to resolve in each individual galaxy by measuring the H1 content in it. You're basically just pointing your telescope at the sky and you're saying, okay, how much H1 intensity is coming from this area? And if there's a lot of H1 intensity, that means there's a lot of matter there. And if there isn't a lot of H1 intensity, that means there's not a lot of matter there. So it doesn't require um, resolving individual galaxies. Uh, so it can be uh, quicker to do this kind of survey. And you can see here, I'm just showing a map of galaxies. And then this is what the equivalent H1 intensity map would look like. You can see it's still tracing the same underlying structure, but it looks a bit different. But it's also, H1 intensity mapping is also good because neutral hydrogen we know has a characteristic emission at a wavelength of 21 centimeters. At, that's basically its rest wavelength. And this rest wavelength we know scales with redshift given this formula. And we can also easily convert this wavelength to frequency. So if we point our telescope at the sky at a particular frequency, we know which redshift we're observing at. So H1 intensity mapping has very good redshift resolution inherently. So we can use it to produce 3D maps of the large scale structure by taking the redshift from the frequency of your observation and then taking the intensity from like your telescope image that you're making of the sky. Uh, and telescopes such as the square kilometer array are going to use intensity mapping to map, map huge areas of the sky. So that's going to be very exciting. And Meerkat, which is its pathfinder, is already operational and taking data. So you can see this from the calibration paper last year is like an example uh, H1 intensity map, but you can't really see a lot of structure here because it still has foregrounds on top, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And also uh, the isolated H1 intensity mapping signal, so just the H1 power spectrum, has not been observed yet in autocorrelation. Only in cross-correlation with galaxy surveys is because um, H1 intensity mapping surveys are still dominated by systematic effects, but the systematic effects between an H1 intensity mapping survey and a galaxy survey shouldn't really correlate. So they drop out when you cross-correlate. So we have detected the cross-correlation signal of H1 with galaxies in the past. This is from GBT. And from that, you can get like omega H1, which is like the cosmic abundance of H1 at a particular redshift. And this is a very interesting parameter. We want to be able to also trace this across different redshifts to see how it has changed across the universe's time scale. So we're very interested in eventually detecting the autocorrelation. But until then, it's very interesting to correlate H1 intensity maps with galaxy surveys. There are some drama drawbacks to H1 intensity mapping. So the your resolution is going to depend on the size of your telescope beam because you're looking at a particular area of the sky and you're saying, give me all of the H1 intensity from that area. So you're not going to be able to resolve any structure that is smaller than that beam area that you're observing at. So you can see that's why the H1 intensity map here looks a bit blurred. So this is going to like damp your small scale power if you try to measure a power spectrum. And it's basically just getting rid of, of more small scale information. And also there are systematic effects such as foregrounds, which obscure our signal. 
So I'm going to talk a bit more about these now. So like I said, the telescope beam damps power on small physical scales. So it's basically blurring your image. So here I'm showing an H1 intensity map without a beam and then with the beam, you can see that you're kind of losing that detail. And this acts on the direction that's perpendicular to your line of sight only because that's where your beam is observing on the sky. And it depends on the size of your telescope dish. So if you have a larger telescope dish, you can observe smaller scales, but you can only build a telescope dish that is so large. You can't keep making one that is larger and larger. Actually, the limit is 100 meters diameter. I'm not sure exactly why. I think there's an engineering reason. And the GBT is 100 meters, so that's like the maximum we're ever going to get. But you can also have like lots of small dishes observing together, but that won't, it won't increase your resolution, but it will make you observe like larger areas of the sky quicker. So we are limited by this, and we're also limited by foregrounds. So a foreground is anything we detect that we don't actually care about. So imagine you're at a party and there's a duck at the dance floor and you want to observe it but there's a bunch of people dancing in front of it and you can't really see it. This is essentially what we're dealing with. In our case, a foreground is any signal that we detect in our frequency of observation that is not the desired H1 signal. And in our case, this comes from astrophysical foregrounds such as galactic synchrotron, point sources, galactic and extragalactic free free emission. And these are several orders of magnitude larger than our H1 signal. So here, on, in this plot, you can see the temperature of different signals as a function of frequency or redshift. And the dotted, like dashed black line is the H1 signal. And you can see that it's not smooth in frequency because it's tracing the structure of the universe, which is not smooth in frequency. And then you can see these solid lines are different foregrounds and they are much brighter in temperature, but they're also smooth in frequency. So this can actually help us remove them as I will show later on. But first, I'm going to talk about how to model the H1 power spectrum when we are still just ignoring that foregrounds exist. So the simplest model you can have for the H1 power spectrum is just an isotropic model, which is just a function of inverse physical separation K. This tells us uh, how matter is clustered from our H1 observations, just as a function of K. And you, you have here your H1 power spectrum, and this is a function of your H1 background temperature, which is really what you're measuring. And this is proportional to omega H1, which is your you know, cosmic abundance of H1, and which I showed that we observed with GBT already, for example. And this is an interesting uh, cosmological parameter. You also have your H1 bias, which is also an interesting cosmological parameter in the same way that the galaxy bias is. And this is here, obviously, because H1 is not a perfect tracer of dark matter. And then, obviously, you have your underlying dark matter power spectrum, which, which the H1 power spectrum is tracing. But uh, we don't actually just have this. So here, I'm showing just an anisotropic model that you can use to describe your H1 power spectrum. And this is actually a function of the inverse physical separation K and also the angle between K and the observer's line of sight, which is called mu yeah is basically not isotropic anymore because you care about about the direction and this now includes the alcock pachinski effect and redshift space distortions and also your shot noise the most interesting parameters that we're interested in observing in this particular model are these Al alcock pachinski effects because parallel one tells you about the hubble constant and the perpendicular tells you about the angular diameter distance and this, of course, tells you about the H1 bias. And this other parameter, which comes from redshift space distortions, tells you about F, the growth rate structure in the universe. So these are the most interesting ones we are actually interested, interested in observing uh, or being able to constrain from this model. And just to clarify a bit, I'm sure many of you know this, but uh, the alcohol effect uh, comes about when you assume a cosmology to convert from redshift to distance, but that cosmology is slightly wrong. That can lead to like some anisotropic distortions in your power spectrum. And then your redshift space distortions come about because you're, you know, you're observing in redshift space, but, you know, galaxies also have weird peculiar motions, especially when they're in falling into a cluster, for example, or just random motion. And this can make the redshift look distorted and their position look distorted because of the Doppler effect. And the short noise is just a statistical term that comes about because you're trying to sample a continuous matter distribution using discrete objects. Um, so this is what makes up our H1 anisotropic model. And you will have noticed that I don't include any sort of perturbation theory or anything. And that's because the beam damps our small scales 
So it actually dumps quite a lot of non-linearities and we find that this model actually works well enough for us up to quite larger K ranges. But of course, we also have to model our systematic effects, such as our beam. And because the beam damps small scales, it's mostly going to affect. And because it, it works in the direction perpendicular to line of sight, your beam model is also going to reflect this and it's going to be anisotropic and just damp modes in perpendicular to the line of sight. And this is basically just given by a Gaussian because this Gaussian is one on the largest scales and then it just drops off and it damps the small scales. And this R here is just your beam size. So this determines how much your small scales are damped. Basically, this is just a damping term, getting rid of some small scale power as a function of the beam size for us. And this just goes in here into a power spectrum as just a general. It just multiplies everything out and damps all the signal, but mostly in the small scales. So this is now our model, it's still ignoring foregrounds, but taking into account the beam and some anisotropic effects. Useful way to then deal with this is to decompose it using Legendre polynomials. And it basically what this does is it isolates your information pretty much as a function of like how nonlinear it is. So L equals zero gives you isotropic information. And then as L increases, we get increasingly anisotropic information, which can be harder to model, but still pretty interesting. So how do we then perform cosmological parameter estimation with this? So we have uh, some simulations. We take the multi-dark n-body simulations. And in this case, each galaxy has an associated cold gas mass. And there are some relationships you can use to convert cold gas mass into H1 mass. And we do this so that for each galaxy, we just have an H1 mass. And then you smooth each frequency slice of your simulation with a telescope beam of SKA-like size. So that gives you an intensity mapping simulation from a n-body simulation. And we do this at a redshift of 0.82. And our box is about one gigaparsec per side and with 225 cells. Um, but we find that like the number of the grid size doesn't really affect our results in this case. Mm -hmm. Just show that our model does agree pretty well with our simulation at very well, actually. So here I'm showing the monopole, the quadrupole, and the hexadecapole. And the black circles are the power spectrum calculated from our simulations. And then this line is our model using the fiducial values of the simulation. So we find that it does agree well. And just to highlight that here on the small scales where the power looks damped, this is where the beam is acting. So it's suppressing our small scale information. And we also want to understand what the error is associated with our power spectrum measurements. So we take a model for the covariance of our power spectrum that is basically just the H1 power spectrum itself plus some instrumental noise that comes from our instrument and is usually just Gaussian noise. And then just divide that by the number of modes in that bin and you then get the covariance for a particular K and mu bin. And this is just the uncertainty on your power spectrum measurements. And we don't take into account the coupling between different K bins, but we do take into account the covariance between different multiples because we find that systematic and instrumental effects actually enhance the covariance between, for example, the monopole and the quadrupole, and they can't be ignored. It's basically a leaking signal between the different ones. And uh, so that's what we take into account for the covariance matrix. And then now we have our model, we have some data, and we have some uncertainty associated with our data. And we want to know what is then the parameter estimation that we can get from our model. So how well can we constrain the cosmological parameters we're interested in constraining? And for this, we do an MCMC analysis. And we find that we get back unbiased results up to K of about 0 0.5. Two, five, and we get below 10% uncertainty on all parameters if we also include the hexadecapole. When including just the monopole and the quadrupole, we find that the same K is fine. It gives us back unbiased results, but slightly larger uncertainties. And then when we include the hexadecapole to get a bit more constraining power, we do find that we have to restrict the maximum K that we go to to be a bit smaller because it, ha it has more nonlinear effects and our model is pretty linear. So we only go up to about k equals 0 0.1 for the hexadecapole. But even going to a smaller k, we find that we do improve constraints. And including the hexadecapole, you can see we do get below 10% uncertainty on all parameters. So this was great. But then, of course, foregrounds exist. 
which um, can make our lives very difficult. So like I said, you have these huge signals dominating over your H1, but you can use the fact that the foregrounds are smooth in frequency and very bright and the H1 is not to try and discern it. So one of the ways of removing foregrounds is by doing a principal component analysis, which basically looks at your data's covariance and then tries to isolate the components that are most contributing to the covariance. So basically the most with the largest variance. And these are going to be the foregrounds because they are by far the brightest components of the data. So if you then remove those, you should just be left with your H1 signal. So here I'm showing just a foreground free map. And then here I'm showing after you've added foregrounds and cleaned them, you can see it looks a little bit different. It almost looks a little bit like some power has been taken away. And that's because it has, because the largest H1 molds in your box are also going to look smooth in frequency. And because PCA is taking the brightness and the smoothest into account, it's going to confuse your large H1 molds with the foregrounds and actually is going to remove them. So power is going to be damped on your large scales. So this is the opposite of the beam. The beam is damping power on small scales and foreground removal is going to damp power on your large scales. As you can see here, here I'm plotting again, just the, the black circles are so just the data without foregrounds. And then the red crosses are your data after you've added foregrounds and removed the foregrounds. And you can see it's fine on the small scales, but on the large scales, your power is being damped. So you're losing information. And also your model does not fit your data well anymore. So this is an issue, but we came up with a model to try and model the effects that foreground removal has on your power spectrum. And it's similar to just the Gaussian damping model that we have for the beam, but it's now damping the large scales instead of the small scales. So it's just one minus the Gaussian. And then you can see it's also just a function of K and mu, but now we have, so for the beam, we were just looking at the direction that was perpendicular to the line of sight. But with the foregrounds, we need to look at both the perpendicular to line of sight and parallel to line of sight directions. And the beam damping model was a function of the telescope size, but the foreground damping model is a function of your box. Because if you think about it, the larger your box, the larger the H1 molds you can fit in it. And so those are going to be the ones that are going to get confused with the foregrounds and removed. But the, if you make your box smaller, that's going to change what modes are getting confused with the foregrounds. So we thought, okay, so it should be a function of the largest physical scale you can fit in whatever direction. So here, K perpendicular min and K parallel min, which is just a, based on your box size. But then, because we can't really claim to know exactly how the foreground removal works beforehand, we also added some free parameters. So here there's N perpendicular and N parallel. And these are basically just, okay, how much of the largest physical scale is being actually removed? So the larger this N parameter is, the more you're removing and the more power you're losing. And this, this is just a free parameter because different surveys are going to have like different foregrounds and there might be similar, but still you're going to need like slightly different ways to remove them. And some might be more aggressive foreground removals, some might be less aggressive, and that's going to change how much power you're removing. So we need to leave this to be a free parameter because we don't really know the truth. And so we try our parameter estimation now in the case of uh, having removed foregrounds from our simulation. And we find if we don't use our foreground damping model, our cosmological parameter results are completely biased. You can see that's the orange dashed line. So you can't trust your, your result in that case. But if you apply our foreground damping model, you find the results are unbiased. So we apply our model by both keeping the N parameters fixed and also varying them. And obviously fixed, you wouldn't be able to do in a real case, but you know it does decrease your uncertainties. So that's nice, but obviously you would want to keep them varied. And by varying them, you still get unbiased results just with slightly larger uncertainty and slightly larger uncertainty also than your foreground free case because you just have extra free parameters and you've lost a little bit of power, a little bit of information. But yeah, you can get them back in an unbiased way and without claiming to know exactly how your foreground removal is working uh, using your model. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what the best way to remove foregrounds is because 
yeah, this is still a work in progress. So people have used PCA a lot in the past, but also people have been looking a bit more at some machine learning methods to try and remove foregrounds because the better we remove foregrounds, the more information is going to be left over. And I, in an ideal world, we would want it to be a perfect removal. So we don't even have to have these, you know, this model with extra free parameters, but we're not quite there yet. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about Gaussian process regression, which is a machine learning method that is used to remove foregrounds from high redshift intensity mapping studies, such as the epoch of reionization, but it has not been used in uh, low redshift studies of intensity mapping. So the ones I'm talking about that just try to trace the large scale structure instead of the epoch of reionization. I wanted to ask, you know, would this work better than PCA? Would this even work in our case at all? So I set out to investigate this, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the method works. So if you think about a multivariate Gaussian distribution, you're basically, your multivariate Gaussian distribution is just defined by some mean vector mu and some covariance matrix. And a Gaussian process is similar but it's a Gaussian distribution defined by a mean function and a covariance function. And these are functions of whatever parameter your data is a function of. So in our case, our data is a function of frequency. So this is just a Gaussian defined by some mean as a function of frequency and some covariance as a function of frequency. So this is how you define a Gaussian process. And in our case, we have um, our smooth foreground and our H1 signal. And our smooth foregrounds are you know, very correlated in frequency. You can see here just some example signals of the smooth foreground as a function of frequency. And then you have the temperature on the y-axis and you can see they're very correlated in frequency and they have a very high amplitude. And they're also overall very smooth in frequency, but our H1 signal is not very correlated in frequency. It has a pretty small amplitude and it's not smooth in frequency. So their covariance functions as a function of frequency are going to look very different. So back to our uh, dance party, you have your foreground, which is the people dancing, you're trying to observe the duck. And if you take all of this, as, if you say your signal is the people plus the duck, uh, I'm going to try and explain how you can do Gaussian process regression to isolate your signal. So if you take your signal as like movement as a function of time, then for the people dancing, it's going to look, you know, pretty, it's going to be a pretty high amplitude signal because they're jumping up and down. Uh, maybe in like a sinusoidal way uh, and your duck is not actually jumping up and down that much it's probably just waddling so its signal is going to have a different rhythm and it's also going to be of a much lower amplitude so for this you can say that your total covariance function is the covariance function of the people plus the covariance function of the duck and you know that these are going to look very different and then if you know what each of these are, then you can take your data and you can say, okay, given the fact that I know my data and it's total covariance function K as a sum of K people plus K duck, what is the signal within the data that best fits just the covariance function of the duck? So you're basically decomposing your data into its different signals and then taking one of the covariance functions and saying, okay, just extract what in the data matches this and then hopefully your data should just give you the movement of the duck. And it's the same thing in our case, because we have our data D and we know that its signals are not related to each other. Like the foregrounds are not dependent on your H1 signal and your instrumental noise is also not dependent on any of these. So we can say that our data's covariance function is going to be a sum of, of, these, of the covariance function of these different signals. And then we can use this to predict what the foregrounds look like in our frequency range by just taking the foreground covariance. And then we can remove this prediction of the foregrounds from the data. But actually the hardest bit when you do this is actually finding exactly what K is, because obviously you don't know perfectly in advance what the covariance function of your different signals are. So the hardest part of this problem is trying to figure this out. And you can do this by trying to fit different covariances to your data. So it's a bit of a guessing game, but you can definitely do it in an informed way. You can use like your, the evidence of different, of different covariance functions uh, versus your data to try and find the best one. And with simulations, obviously we can do this. 
and we can check our results against the truth. But also, just to plug, if you're interested in, in running Gaussian process regression as a foreground removal, we do have a publicly available code with easy example and introductory Jupyter notebooks. And we have some example H1 intensity maps there and also uh, some poor power spectrum code. So if you're interested in that, uh, check out our code. It's just on GitHub. So now I'm going to just quickly talk about some results. So like I said, in our simulations, we know the truth. So here is the power spectrum as a function of K and the truth is the black solid line. That's what we want to recover. And we try first to do this using PCA. And with PCA, you have to choose the number of principal components that you're removing. So basically how much of the foregrounds you're removing. And we choose here both n equals two and n equals three. And these are the red and blue lines here. Um, and you can see they're pretty complementary. One overestimates, one underestimates, but they're pretty similar on, on the small scales. And the GPR results are in green. And we wanted to look a bit closer at the differences. So we plotted the percentage residual here as a function of K. So you can see GPR does seem to work a bit better on the small scales, but on the large scales, it looks pretty similar to PCA n equals three. However, one of the important things here is that for PCA, you have to fine tune this parameter n, to, which is you know, basically how many principal components you're removing. And you don't know the truth beforehand. Here we do because we're using simulations, but with real data, you would literally just be fine tuning this parameter you know, and trying to figure out, you know, do I think the foregrounds are gone or not? And obviously there are some ways of doing that, but with GPR, you can actually try and fit covariance matrices to your data and use like the log marginal likelihood to figure out if it is actually a good fit to your data. So GPR is a bit more robust in justifying your decisions for the foreground removal that you're doing. So it's not exactly that GPR is better than PCA. It is here in this case on small scales. And also when we look at just the radio power spectrum, we find that GPR is better than PCA in that case, because, you know, we only took in frequency information, basically. So GPR works really well in the frequency direction, but it's just a complementary method. We find that does work really well and better than PCA in some cases, but also it is important to have different methods because you know, your H1 intensity mapping survey might have a lot of systematic effects that you don't exactly understand and that you don't even know about beforehand. And if you have different methods of removing foregrounds that work in completely different ways, then applying them and seeing what you get in the different cases might give you a clue as to what you're missing in one case or what's actually there in your data that you hadn't realized. So it's good to have these different methods. And we were able to show that indeed you can use GPR as a Foreground removal technique in our low redshift intensity mapping case. So uh, the key takeaways is H1 intensity mapping is a very promising probe of the large scale structure, and it is possible to conduct cosmological parameter estimation with H1 intensity mapping with a pretty simple power spectrum model. But it leads to biased results if the foreground removal is not properly accounted for. But we showed a model where you can take into account the foreground removal with some free parameters. And then it, that makes your results unbiased. We also showed um, Gaussian process regression is a good method for removing foregrounds in low redshift H1 intensity mapping and complementary to PCA. And again, if you're interested in checking that out, our code is available on GitHub. Thank you very much.